we have our fine candidates here tonight. We're going to question them and grill them and give them only 30 seconds to answer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Bird says we're going to give them 90, so, you know. Now, uh, this particular format, we've got uh, questions that are already been, been decided upon that we feel are really important. Um, if you go over 30, over 90 seconds, you'll get a 15 second warning on the floor, but your uh, chair drops through the floor. So, Bert, if you want to come on up here and get us going, that'd be great. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I sure appreciate everybody uh, being here for this meeting. It's a Tea Party forum, which is probably different than the usual Republican forum that's here because we have all different candidates, including the Libertarian candidate here tonight. Um, the Tea Party got started, as you know, a few years ago, and it's really because citizens like us have been very upset about our government. It keeps growing, has many problems. Uh, we have inflation, uh, crony capitalism, uh, counterproductive welfare system, spying on us in the name of our defense, no coherent uh, immigration policy, um, and they're trying to take over our education and health care systems at this time. So the Tea Party got formed to try to see if we can't do something. And it's gone through, I think, primarily an educational phase, first few years, where the Tea Party members now have studied the Constitution. We've studied federalism. We've studied these things. And we are now having candidate forums to find out how they feel on these issues and these solutions that are important, I think, to most of the Tea Party members. Although, of course, we're not uh, homogenous by any means. We have different ideas, but in general I think we believe that the taxes are too high and that uh, we have too much government at all levels, and this is the federal forum tonight. Uh, I also want to thank uh, not only the Tea Party members that are here, but the audience members who are not Tea Party members coming out to hear what these candidates have to say. And of course we want to thank the candidates themselves that are here. We have two candidates <coughs> for the United States Senate. Um, Dara, Derek Grayson and Amanda Swan, uh, Swan, Swafford. Swafford, I'm sorry, Amanda. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she is a Libertarian candidate, and Derek is a Republican uh, candidate. So I think it will be very interesting. The questions are all the same, because this is the Congress, consistent in both the House and the Senate. Um, we also have uh, Mr. Fontaine, who is running against Doug Collins, the 14th district. No. Oh. <laughs> the 9th district. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, it, it gets it. And then Mr. Karen Heron is running against Tom Graves in the 9th, 14th. The 14th district. <laughs> I ran in the 9th. They changed the 14th, so I get confused <laughs> on that issue this time. But I learned my lesson. I hope you all keep doing it. <laughs> Um, there's no right or wrong answer. We just want to know how you feel on these various issues. Um, we'll rotate who goes first. I'll start over with Mr. Grayson. Um, and if somebody's already said something that you feel about, just say that you know I agree with it. We can uh, move things on a little bit uh, more though. Um, the first one is going to be on taxes, and of course that's one of the main thing about the Tea Party. We're taxing up already. I was actually going to uh, start tonight with an Obama joke because he's the one that's, you know, raising our taxes. But I was afraid that I'd probably get audited by the IRS, so I forego <laughs> that joke. That ship's already sailed, bud. Right? Um, now, what I'd uh, like to do is show a show of hands for the different types. Now, we have our uh, current tax system. Um, and that is how many people here would like to keep the current system as it is? Nobody. <laughs> Who would like to see a flat income tax, which would include, of course, the mortgage exemptions? Anybody in favor of that? Anybody in the audience in favor of a flat tax that would include the mortgage exemption? Mr. Fay is good for him. He's always been a contrarian. Um, <laughs> 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 Uh, who would uh, like to repeal the 16th uh, Amendment and replace it with some form of a sales tax? 
And who would like to do something different than what we've mentioned? <laughs> All right. Um, we'll start with Mr. Grayson. Uh, 90 seconds for everybody to, uh, to explain his position. Just, just so you know, I'll give you. A, I'll, I'll get. I'll just flash my hand when you got 15 seconds to go. Okay. Just. I don't want to interrupt you, but I just so you yeah. see it. Yeah, we want everybody to make sure they yes. finish their final thought and not feel rushed. But we have a lot of questions to go through. It's a pleasure to be here. And, um, can you hear me? Yeah. There you go. What, can I hold up a second? I'm sorry, Mr. Grayson. I made a mistake in that. I. That's that's. I want everybody to introduce themselves, and if you would start off doing that. You won't be timed. <laughs> Nine seconds. I don't spend much time talking about myself because I'm not that important. I'm an American citizen, just like you, 54 years old, and uh, served in the military, uh, grew up in Atlanta, and I'm a taxpayer. I've worked my, all my life, I've raised my daughters, and I know what it is to feel the struggles um, that most Americans are struggling with today. But I've come to recognize that it is at the hands of government, and government is able to get away with it because we have advocated our responsibility to hold them accountable. So my mission now is to wake up as many people as I can and get them to understand that we need to take the country back because they won't get it back. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, would you like to? Absolutely. My name is Amanda Swafford, and I am uh, somewhat local here in the area. I was uh, in, uh, born in Flyer Branch, Georgia, Hall County. I uh, actually served a term there in Flyer Branch on the Flyer Branch City Council. Um, I've been also served um, <coughs> in a local office in California. Um, currently, I'm working a full time job as a paralegal in Gainesville, Georgia. Um, and I'm running as a libertarian. I'm a little different than Mr. Grayson in the sense that I'll be on the ballot in November. I won't be on your ballot in May when you go and vote in a few weeks like Mr. Grayson will. Um, I, um, what else can I say? Um, I've been involved in politics for 30 years, which is a little strange considering my <coughs> youth here. Um, but actually, I remember um, in 1984, I wrote a letter to uh, Ronald Reagan and got a response back from him in school. And that started the, uh, uh, the fire in the belly, I guess you could say, that got me involved in politics. And I began following it at that point in time um, with the Walter Mondale and Reagan race in 84. And um, started following that and getting involved as I got older with candidates and following um, getting involved in the grassroots level and local candidates up to the statewide level. And I uh, went to Washington in 1996 to work for a political action committee there when I was in college. Um, and now I've uh, been involved here locally and statewide for some time, and so I've decided to run for United States Senate. And I can provide some more information about that later on in closing arguments. But um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Ken Aaron, and I'm a retired carpet uh, executive and consultant. I've worked in foreign countries. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, Dubai, and Canada uh, as a consultant solving problems. And we've got more problems in Washington, D.C. than any other place in the world. And I believe that I can help. I uh, can't do it by myself. There's too many uh, people up there with a big ego that wants to be president. And I don't want to be president. But I can't get them to cooperate. But I'm going to do my best to introduce bills that will make a difference. Uh, I'm a graduate of Georgia Tech. Uh, you ain't got my 15 seconds yet? <laughs> when I do, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Burt ran for, for uh, Congress and came over to Hawk, uh, Calhoun uh, time after time to be at the Red. Uh, what is this word? Uh, tax uh, Tea Party. I'll, I'll get it on. Uh, it's a lot of pressure. I'm a, I'm a one man campaign. <laughs> I don't have anybody working with me, just me. And I'm out four or five times a week making speeches and talking to people. So uh, if I get mixed up, just forgive me. Besides that, I'm old. 
you're experienced. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Seasoned. Season. Okay, my name is Barney Fontaine. I'm a retired military officer. I spent 30 years on active duty. Uh, and a lot of that time was spent working on large military projects, so I know something about how money is spent. I uh, then spent 15 years teaching political science, so I know a little bit about that too. I'll tell you what I'm not. I'm not a, I'm not a, a lawyer. Someone asked me that, and I told them, no, I'm not. So they said they both for me. I'm, I'm obviously not an incumbent. Incumbents don't want to be here, apparently. <laughs> um, and that's okay. Um, but I, I am not a career-type person, obviously, and neither is Ken. We're, th we're at this because we feel it needs to be done, okay? I'm not looking for a career. I've got a calling. Because after all the time that I spent, working for my government, doing the best I could, and then when I see it in a downward spiral like it is, and what is happening, I felt that I had to step up, and that's why I am. Now, there. I, um, I am a one-man operation also, so I can appreciate what Ken is saying there. I do not have any PAC money, okay? My special interest is the people of the 9th District. Period. That's what it is. Now, one quick thing here, then you cut me off. If you're a veteran, come and get one of these. If you're a mama or grandma, come and get one of these. These are magnetics to put the kids' pictures on the wall. No matter who you vote for, go ahead and take one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've now heard the opening remarks from the uh, candidates, and we will go to the first question. And in the spirit of rotating, I'll ask Ms. Swafford to uh, give her feelings about uh, the tax system and what she would do if anything to change it. Okay, sure. Um, I'm an advocate of the fair tax. Um, That's very strong uh, core of my belief system. And I got started uh, working with the fair tax fairly early. I um, went to travel the country actually when I was uh, in between when I came back from law school before I uh, saw the uh, full-time employment and traveled uh, part of the southeast to attend a lot of the rallies with Neil Bortz uh, and, and a lot of those folks and uh, actually led an organization, uh, a group, um, up to Washington, D.C. to participate in an IRS uh, rally up there in D.C. with the Fair Tax Organization in Hall County. Um, so I'm a real strong believer of the Fair Tax. First and foremost, the reason I raised my hand in terms of what I would do differently is that I would repeal the 16th Amendment if it's presented to me and it's politically feasible. We've got enough people that are interested, that will, are willing to sign on to the, that would be the, probably the first thing I would do um, is, is repeal the income tax, go for the 16th Amendment um, repeal of that and not have an income uh, tax at all. The income system, uh, taxation system is um, completely, um, uh, pro prohibitive and uh, progressive system. Um, I actually have worked as a tax professional with HR Block um, for uh, four or five tax seasons and with another competitor outside uh, the state as well. Um, so that would be the first thing I would do. If we can't get that, then I would go and support the fair tax as a compromise or a secondary measure to that with all the research that that organization has put into that. I believe that is a fair, that is a fair system that will actually help the uh, economy, the underground economy as well. Thank you, Mr. Well, Mayor. We've saved some time. I'm 100% for the fair tax. I read the book. I like it. I want to do it uh, like it's already been proposed in Congress, where for the very poor folks, we give them enough to cover the sales tax uh, so they don't increase their uh, cost of living. But the rest of us just pay when we spend our money. You don't have to have any, uh, the rich folks pay more and the poor folks pay less. Uh, everybody's paying the same thing. Okay, some of you may have noticed I didn't put my hand up. It was an error on my part. I, if you're going to, you know, get rid of the 16th Amendment, uh, you should have something to put in its place. And obviously the fair tax is the thing to put in its place. I agree with Ken, you know, the tax is not the thing to use to do social engineering to where you're paying money to people that do nothing and other people are being bled to death. It's just not a fair system at all. So yes, I'm 100% for it. As you say, and Doctor, you, you are a constitutionalist and uh, I agree, we'll get, get rid of that. And before that amendment was in place, we had taxes. So we can still have the 
fair tax without the 16th Amendment, if you will. You agree? I agree totally. I've been <laughs> somewhat of an advocate for getting rid of the 16th Amendment for 20 years now, I guess. Always be nice to the judge and the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Good policy. Or, or the general. <laughs> um, the next question oh, is... Mr. Grayson. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Grayson. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> As a point of education, uh, the reason we're getting rid of the 16th Amendment is so that the government don't have two systems in place if we were to pass a fair tax. So that's what that's all about. And I'm not going to spend any time educating you on the fair tax. We all know we don't like the current system. It's adversarial. It needs to go. What I am going to tell you is this. We're not asking the right, right question. And the question to be asked, why haven't we had any tax reform in 30 years. The reason we haven't had any tax reform in, in 30 years is twofold. One, because they don't want tax reform. They like it the way it is. And two, we keep voting for those same people who will stand up in this room and tell you, I support tax reform, but they will get right up there in D.C. and say, well, you know, I couldn't push it through, and that is all garbage. The way you pass legislation, and it's already been written, thanks to men like Neil Bortz, you get up there, you present it. If they stall it in committee, you expose the people that are stalling it so that their constituents can fire them. Once it comes out of the committee, you have a vote and you expose those that vote against it and those that vote against it, you let their constituents fire them. That is how you pass legislation. It's not rocket science. So ask the question, why don't we have tax reform? Because they don't want it and because we let them get away with it. Thank you. question is on the Constitution, and this is very important for Tea Party members. Most of them are constitutionalists, and they know what the Tenth Amendment says. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now there is a bill, and we can't go through all of the unconstitutional things that are there. We'd be here for probably at least ten years with the legislations that are out there. But this uh, last year, there's HR, HJR 77, and this was a bill to continue to fund the uh, Food and Drug Administration. And the uh, representatives uh, who are not here, Braun Graves and Kingston's, all voted yes on this bill to continue funding the FDA. Now the FDA's mission is to protect consumers in enhancing public health by maximizing the compliance of FDA regulated products and minimizing risk associated with these products. The problem is that there's a great delay and increased cost in getting medications to the market and as this delay occurs, people are dying who don't have life-saving medications. Um, now my question to, the, to our candidates are, is the FDA constitutional? If it is constitutional, could you let us know what part of the Constitution? If you were uh, voting on funding the FDA, would you vote to fund it? Um, and you all have 90 seconds to answer, and Mr. Heron, you're first. I don't have any problem with that. The Tenth Amendment is the confirmation of Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which says that everything not listed there is the responsibility of the states. It does not include uh, the FDA. That's not something that the federal government can do. It doesn't include education. It doesn't include energy. It doesn't include commerce. The, all of those things are supposed to be responsibilities of the state government. And I will be in favor of and will do my best to move some of them at least back to the states and get them away from the federal government's control. Uh, we don't need to be uh, letting the federal government take over everything. And Education particularly, I'd like to see it 
the Department of Education just wiped out and it go back to the states, local control of education is the proper way to educate. You need some regulations, but uh, he wants to say something. He raised the same. <laughs> Okay, um, I agree with most of what Ken says. Is you know, obviously that we have way too much government. Twenty-two million people working for for what? They're getting you know. We need gun control. We need gun control of the IRS where we need it. <laughs> There's no reason anybody in the IRS should be carrying what. That's off the track. Let me get back to the track. Um, the Food and Drug Administration. If you've ever read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Um, You'll see, you know, why they came up with this. Now, there is an interstate commerce clause in the main body of the Constitution. And I believe that, you know, you ought to have some, I, I don't worry about the meat I eat because I grow my own, but you're, the food that you get ought to be, you know, you ought to have some assurance that it is not rotten and everything else, um, like it was before the FDA. Having said that, there's way, way too much FDA, there's way, way too much involved, especially money when it comes to drugs. Uh, and I, um, I, I think it's, it's really criminal that if somebody is dying uh, and they want a, a drug, that you can't get the drug because some bureaucrat says you can't have it. Well, hell, if you're gonna die, this might save you. And I think it's criminal, and, you know, I would be 100% for cutting all that out. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Grayson. The Food and Drug Administration, the intent is understandable, and the way it was presented because of our Commerce Clause, uh, again, it is understandable. I want to say food, and I don't know if any of you have ever dealt with unscrupulous businesses they exist. So I don't have a problem with having safe food or medications. However, the Food and Drug Administration, like many of the other um, agencies within the federal bureaucracy, engage in overreach. And people in the government, people in business, benefit by that overreach. And the American people ultimately end up suffering. I would like to see many agencies done away with because they are purely unconstitutional like the Department of Education, which bears no part in the Commerce Clause, but things like the Food and Drug Administration, we don't want to end up with 50 different types of protections, some greater than the others, some worse than others, so with, within reason, I am not opposed to having some protections in place uh, for our, the food and, and medications that we consume in our bodies. I, I don't see how the FDA can possibly be constitutional. I know the Commerce, Commerce Clause has been used routinely throughout history to pervert how things can be constitutional. So that alone, I don't really give that any credence to say that the FDA can be constitutional. Government's primary responsibility, in my view, is to preserve the individual freedom of an individual, even to the detriment of other noble goals. When, when someone uh, has an illness or they are in need of uh, certain medications, there's such thing as an assumption of the risk. And I think in this country, we've gotten a long way away from the assumption of the risk. An individual should have the freedom to assume the risk that they are going to be exposed to bad drugs if they're not prepared to do their research to find out or to go through the channels that they need to go through to take the responsibility of understanding the medications and the trials that they want to be involved in. But the FDA, as, as we've heard, and as everyone is pretty familiar with, contributes to delays in the market and, and restrains the free market from being accessible to those that need it. You look at the systems that are in play in Europe and the drugs and the treatments that they're able to get to far before we're able to get to that. And you really have to see and analyze whether the FDA does more harm than good in certain situations. And I don't think that they do very good in a lot of situations. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, the next question has to do with amnesty. And I think most Tea Party members agree that we have a tremendous problem in our country right now with undocumented illegal aliens, whatever you want. Now, we may need these people. Well, they may be good people. But our laws should be made and should be followed, I feel. Um, one of the major things that people talk about is uh, securing our borders first. Uh, would everybody who believes that before we give anybody amnesty that we would secure our borders, would uh, yes would say we should secure our borders first. Okay, and we have about a split on this. Um, can we um, now uh, have our people and then start down Mr. Fontaine discussing uh, his views on this issue? It gives me the tough one. <clears throat> no amnesty. Uh, to me, amnesty is, you know, forgiveness for what? Uh, we should enforce the law, number one. Number two, secure the border. <coughs> and you secure the border, not just at the border, but you do a credible job there, and Eric Holder is not doing his job. He needs to be faced with a writ of mandibus through the court telling him to do his job according to the law, period. And it uh, has nothing to do with race or anything else. It has to do with doing the job, period. If you can't stand the heat, tell him to get out of the kitchen. That's what Harry said, okay? Now, the uh, employers are another big part of this, okay? I've worked for employers before. I was a construction superintendent for a while just for the heck of it. And, uh, you know, we were paying people on 1099 who were a contractor that couldn't read or speak English. They cash a check, send the money home, and they were good people. They worked hard. But the contractor was taking advantage of them and taking advantage of all of us by cutting corners to make some more money. That's not right. Okay. Now, the people that are here, it's 12 million people, more or less, nobody's counting them. Uh, they need a workable work visa, you know, and the Social Security card is a joke. I can reproduce it with a crayon, okay? We need a decent work visa, and then we can put those people on a permanent visa until they get straightened out. That doesn't mean amnesty. It means doing what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grayson. Cause and effect. No dog will dwell in the meat house if there is no meat. <laughs> we have a problem with illegal immigration because we incentivize illegal immigration. They can come here and have a baby and stay because of our anchor baby system. They can get medical treatment. They can benefit from our social services. They can even come here and work. Our problem is we need to stop the anchor baby, anchor baby situation, we need to cut off social services to illegal immigrants, and we need to streamline the process for immigration and come up with better worker programs for those that they claim we need those jobs and we need to hold accountable businesses that hire those illegal immigrants. Make no mistake about it. People benefit off of illegal immigration. We've been here before under Ronald Reagan, three million illegal immigrants. But you know what? We didn't have an illegal immigration problem 15, 20, and 30 years prior to that. It is only because of the growth of our social programs that has created this problem. And if we give amnesty to these guys, we are going to collapse our own economic system. I think you have to you have to take a look at actually if you are a, another another issue in terms of why uh, immigrants decide to come to this country is the wage pressures independent of the presumed benefits that they may or may not be getting by coming to this country you have to look at the wage pressures that are on uh, the immigrants that come to the country and a lot of the places. Um, there's four to 16 times they can make the same amount of money or more money by coming to this country and doing the same work they would be doing in their home countries, um, which is a huge incentive, independent of anything else, to come here. I mean, if you could earn 50, 30 to 40, 50 percent more income by changing your country of residence, 
how many of you would do it um, if you lived in the conditions that a lot of these immigrants live in? Uh, you have to really look at that. Um, and right now, if you're a low-skilled immigrant, there's no category in America for you to come here legally. There's no way for them to come here legally. So you're looking at a dynamic that already by its nature is creating a situation where they are going to fight to come here. So you have to look at building a wall around the systems that you've created in that situation, not necessarily creating a restriction on the ability of those folks to sell and trade with their most valuable asset, which is their labor. Uh, you, and you really have to look at that in a sense that in one way they really don't compete with a lot of Americans because they are low skilled. A lot of them don't even have high school educations and they can't speak English, which is the one thing Americans can do. So they're not taking the hostess's jobs or the waitressing jobs, they're doing busing jobs, for example. And this is a complicated issue. It's not going to be talked about and solved in one minute that we have to talk to you guys. So. 90 seconds. Please. 90 seconds. <laughs> Oh, that's right. I'm counting. Never mind. Well, I worked as an immigrant in four different foreign countries. I was never illegal. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, I had to have uh, what they called an igama. It was like a passport. It had to be on me all the time so that I could prove who I am. I could uh, go places. I had to have identification on me. We need a system in this country where every immigrant is identified. Now, if they have come over illegally and they're here now, let's secure the border and then survey and get them and register them if they're working, give them uh, a permit or some reason uh, to identify themselves so they can stay and work. And those that aren't working, let's send them home. And let's change our constitution so that there's no such thing as an anchor baby. If you're born to American citizens, you're American. If you're in America and born to non-citizens, you're not a citizen of this country. That's one of the things. I worked in Egypt. I worked in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, there were a few illegal immigrants but they didn't have regular jobs. They worked as housemaids, uh, they worked as uh, laborers in gardens and stuff like this, but they could not work in an established business if you were illegal, because they had to have identification and to prove who they were. Thank you. The uh, next question has to do with Sharia law. And of course, uh, I think most of us realize this has become a problem in certain areas in our country. I understand that in uh, Michigan now there's some uh, counties or cities that are starting to use Sharia law. And my question to the uh, uh, candidates is a show of hands for any who would vote yes for Sharia law at the federal level. Can we have a show of hands uh, if they would uh, say that the federal government could dictate to the states that they could not have uh, Sharia law? Could I show up sure. hands of people who would say that the federal government can dictate to the states that they cannot have Sharia law? Cannot have. Yeah. How many people would vote that the federal government can dictate that to the states? I, I need some clarification on yes, that sir. question. When you say Sharia law, my understanding is they have certain religious practices, like the women have to wear the things around their head. I don't have a problem with that. That doesn't hurt what I do. But if they want to stone a, 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 a girl to death because she went out and, and, and had sex with somebody, that has nothing to do with Sharia law from my perspective. We have a law that prohibits murder. So I'm not understanding really the, the question. I, so that's kind of a hard one for me. I don't have a problem with people practicing their religious faith as long as it does not violate any of our existing laws. We have our foundational law. We don't need a secondary. That's the yes. problem. This is a secondary. 
There in, is in a lot of cases it overrides ours. In other words, they are codifying this into some of the governments around the country. And what I'm, as I understand it, now I'm no expert, but I do understand that in, in Michigan, can you hear me? No. I do understand that in Michigan, uh, there are some uh, municipalities that are using Sharia law. So they would say, if you don't wear your veil, uh, you go into jail, I'm making this up, but they have this type of thing. And what I'm trying to find out is, I don't think anybody in this panel would vote yes, that they would vote for Sharia law, law at the national level, but what I'm partially trying to find out, if you think it's a constitutional thing, that if a state or a municipality wants to do it, that the federal government has the constitutional authority to say, no, a state cannot do that without a constitutional amendment. Are you, are you ready to answer this now, Mr. Grayson? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes. It's my turn to answer that? Yes, sir. <laughs> I think that the states should follow the federal guideline. Uh, our Constitution is a supreme law of the land and if it does not allow for any secondary legal systems to come and usurp uh, the protections of American citizens, what would make a state think that they could do could do could do that as well. Uh, we're already fighting against uh, a situation with the UN where they want to uh, Obama and his administration and some people on both sides of the aisle would like to see us subjected to uh, the UN gun tree, so I would put that in the same boat as, as, as Sharia law. No, at the federal and at the state. Thank you. Ma, ditto. I mean, we have the Constitution. That's it. That's all we need. Good answer. So, Mr. Heron? I'm a little bit unique because. I lived five years in the Arab countries that had Sharia law. Uh, I mean, I know what it is. I, I know where Chomp Chomp Square was, where they cut off people's heads for doing certain things. And I saw people with their hand cut off because they stole something. Uh, we don't need to allow that in our country at all. Incidentally, what Sharia law is, is a total compliance to the Quran. Whatever the Quran says is the law. They don't have another group of laws that they put together. It's how they interpret uh, the Quran. Now, some of them interpret it one way and some of them another. It's sort of like our Bible. Everybody don't agree with me on the Bible, and you're all wrong. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's sort of what it is, and we don't need that at all. We don't need anywhere in our country a case where people are doing things that are not constitutional. Now, in Paris, France, there's a group of about one million people living in one section, and there is no federal police or anybody that goes in there. That million people govern themselves under Sharia law, and France allows it. We don't need that in this country. Okay, that was a bit of a tricky question, Mr. Constitutionalist. Uh, if you want to get real technical about it, yes. But I tell you one thing, how does the Constitution start? It says, we the people, right? Okay, if we the people don't want Sharia law, and I think that's a given, then if we have to abandon the Constitution, that would be, you know, to make it just technically correct. The bottom line is we don't want Sharia law, period. Now, it's like the Australian says, if you don't like it, go somewhere else, you know. Okay, this is the way we play the game here. I mean, if I go to another country, I expect, if I go to Mexico, I expect to have to speak Spanish. I don't expect everybody to learn how to speak English for me. Uh, and this is, this is part of all of, of the same problem. Now it's time we start, or I should say stop, apologizing and start asserting our rights 
Period. That's what Obama says. Period. Thank you. <laughs> Period. Thank you all. Uh, the next topic is the uh, standoff that's occurring in Nevada. Uh, Rancher Bundy apparently has grazed his cattle there for a hundred years, and then the federal government came in and made uh, the state of Nevada and the Bureau of Land Management came in and said, well, we own 84% of the state and we are going to uh, uh, control that. Uh, Bundy's uh, apparently family signed a contract and they're changing this contract right now and he also questions whether there's any constitutional authority for the federal government to own any land in the United States except for defense purposes and the 10 square miles that was allowed for uh, Washington. Um, the uh, Bureau of Land Management seized his cattle and now there's been this confrontation. Thank goodness there's been no uh, significant bloodshed, although some people were tased. Um, and there's also a question about the federal government using this as an endangered tortoise. Um, some conservatives feel that Bundy's in the wrong, that he should be following the rule of law, that he hasn't paid his taxes, therefore he shouldn't be able to graze his cattle. Other people feel it's a more deep constitutional question, and I would like the panel uh, to discuss uh, their feelings on this uh, current issue that's before us. Uh, Ms. Walker. First of all, I would sell the land. Why do we own so much land in Nevada? Federal government is, is not a landlord and should not be in the real estate business. I know we addressed those very issues when I was sitting on the Fayette Ranch City Council. Government should not be in the real estate business. And I'm tired of the government acting like it should be in all kinds of businesses. It's there to preserve individual freedoms and very few other objectives. So get it out of the business of doing real estate. Um, regardless of whether Mr. Bundy upheld the law or not, the government went about it totally in the wrong way. Uh, the proper way to do it is through the lien process. There's other ways to handle it without these confrontational shows that they needed to do. I mean, how many times have we wanted the federal government to get involved in other things where they didn't even raise a, a flag or even do anything when the stakes were so much higher than, than turtles or cattle that were involved? So, you know, the whole thing, fortunately, didn't turn out, hasn't turned out so far to be more of a disaster than it, than it has, but the government just totally is not putting forth the proper response on that whatsoever. Um, but, you know, I definitely the lean process and, and not this, this um, stampede that we're trying to see down there and showing the things that they're trying to do. Thank you, Mr. Heron. Well, from what I understand that the real story is over out in Nevada, it's that Harry Reid's son is trying to get control of that property so he can sell it to a group of Chinese that want to put a solar farm out there and generate electricity to sell to the grid. That's what I understand. And, uh, I, I wouldn't doubt it whatsoever that that's what they're after. That's what, from what I've seen, uh, Mr. Bundy paid his taxes as he always has. He didn't pay taxes on the property where his cattle are grazing because it's just land. Uh, if he don't graze the grass off of it, it'll, it'll just be dying. Uh, nothing will come off of it. The grass costs nobody anything. So he shouldn't even have to pay for it. Belongs to all of us. Am I wrong, Summer? Graze the state. Why do you graze the state for grazing? And just like just like people that own property in Nevada, all those ranches out there. They they have never paid state for grazing. Yes, Anybody? They Did they? Yeah, yes. I have I have land in Nevada. And I, I, I sell it, I, I lease, lease it out to, to different ranches and grazing. Okay. And they pay, it's not a lot of money. It's like 50 bucks a hundred acres. Well, I don't think that's been established. I, I, right. As I understand it, there was never, that it was never an established practice. Actually, it was established with the state. It wasn't established with the federal government. That's where the state came in. The state did, had established it, but the federal government had, didn't have standing. So. 
It's all about turtles. Let's make soup. Well, thank y'all for helping. <laughs> it's all about turtles and yeah. starts, darter snails, and great cockaded woodpeckers. And, you know, there's all sorts of excuses for people to make money. Behind every environmental hullabaloo, there's somebody making money. Uh, if you want to know about Harry Reid and where that's going, look at Open Secrets. Uh, Google Open Secrets up and look at anybody's and you'll see where the money is. Okay. Uh, you won't see where Ken and I got any money there, though. Uh, now, to get back to the situation, I have to agree that, you know, what is the federal government doing managing this land? A. B. What are they doing with a bunch of goons out there with automatic weapons? I have problems. When the IRS carries weapons, I have problems when the Bureau of Land Management carries weapons. I carried weapons for 30 years, but I had a reason for doing it. And some people didn't like us. And I think people in uniform may have a reason for carrying a weapon, but all of these bureaucrats do not have a reason. And the way they're going about this is totally wrong. Now, if the law is wrong, then we need to change the law. There are laws that have been wrong in the past, you know, Dred Scott, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, a lot of laws have been wrong in the past and got changed, and that's what needs to happen here. We need to get out of the land business. There's no reason for the federal government to be in the land business. Let the state of Nevada deal with it. But don't sell it to anybody outside the United States, especially China. Thank you. Mr. Grayson? Just to give you some additional information. 20 years ago, he stopped paying the grazing fees to the BLM. He paid what was due to the state. Um, 20 years later, uh, they end up in court and he's told that he owes $1.2 million. He loses, they settle, but he doesn't want to pay. But here's what went wrong. First, the BLM has no business owning that much land. Two, if the man owed money, they should have behaved as most of us would. We would go in and, and get our money judgment and place a lien upon the man's property. They didn't do that. What lies beneath, and they have been trying to cover their tracks, and the information is out there if you dig hard enough for it, there was an unhanded deal with Harry Reid's son um, to have solar panels via the Chinese placed on that land. You can't build those solar panels when you've got a bunch of cows grazing around on, on the land. And that's what it is all about. But I need y'all to understand something. Infrastructure has already been put in place. Indefinite detention is a provision that allows for the government to arrest what they would term domestic terrorists. These protesters were called domestic terrorists by Harry Reid. Get ready, they're coming. They're not going to stop there either. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the next uh, topic is free trade versus fair trade. Mr. Heron has part of his campaign is on this particular issue. And as I understand, it's a complex issue about trades and quotas. And some people say that during the Great Depression that they had the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, which put a recession into the Great Depression. Now that's controversial. Uh, what's not controversial is that um, in the 80s, early 80s, Harley-Davidson motorcycles was in deep trouble from all the competition from the foreign areas, and that mic. President Reagan. Use the mic. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I was talking about free trade versus fair trade, and that, that um, in the Great Depression, the Smoot Hawley tariff, some people said, caused uh, a recession to become the Depression. And then uh, during President Reagan's <coughs> term in the early 80s, Harley Davidson Motorcycles was having a problem, was about to go bankrupt, as I understand it, and he put on tariffs and quotas to the Japanese motorcycles coming into the country and is, is now, uh, and that's fact, and this is, uh, it's controversial, but this is attributed to saving 
the Harley Davidson motorcycles in this uh, country. And uh, Mr. Herons, uh, we'd like to have your uh, feelings about free trade uh, versus uh, fair trade. He and I have been going back and forth about this subject on the internet, and he's very much in favor of free trade, and I'm very much against it. So uh, he, still, he told me I need to talk to some other Republicans so I could try to get myself straightened out. But I think I'm straight. <laughs> In 1885, the federal government's income, 56% of it came from import tariffs. And then it went down until today, it's 1.2% of our income. So it made our products cheaper by eliminating the, the tariffs. We can go to Walmart and buy products cheaper. But the federal government didn't cut out the expenses. When they didn't get that income, they came at us from somewhere else. They still are getting the money. We've saved a little bit of money on buying things, but we ain't saved any money on our cost of living because our taxes otherwise went up. Now, what it cost us, there used to be a 7% tariff on textiles. The textile tariff was taken away. Every bit of the textiles moved. We got one plant, Trine, up here with 1,800 employees. That's about all there is in Georgia. And they all left because the tariff uh, uh, was taken away. And it was not excessive. It was just to balance the trade. Can I agree with you 100% on this? And uh, the main issue I'm pushing in the 9th District, and I know he is also the 14th, is that we need jobs. And the way to get jobs is have industry here. And our industries have moved to China and other Southeast Asian countries. Now what he's talking about is leveling the playing field, where we pay 20% on stuff going that way, they pay nothing on stuff coming this way. We need to level that thing out, for starters. As a matter of fact, I think we need an import tariff uh, to level the field because they're paying people a buck a day to work over there, and our standard of living is somewhat higher than that. Uh, the, there are several things that will bring industry back here. The throwing of, of, of money in the southeast and southwest Asia, you know, trying to buy France is ridiculous, absolutely ludicrous. That money could be put to much better use here in these two districts through block grants, I feel. My, my opponent doesn't feel that way. He'd rather throw money away in Afghanistan, I guess. But uh, we need it here. We need help. We need to get people back to work. It's, it's that simple. That's, that's the issue. Thank you. I talk about how free trade is destroying this country, how it has resulted in the offshoring of manufacturing and jobs. But that's not the crux of the problem. They want it this way. Who owns the corporations like Walmart? Shareholders. They're getting rich because of free trade. They can produce products cheaper, sell more of it here, we buy it, and they make a ton of money. And that's the same with most of the corporations. They make millions and billions of dollars because of free trade. Those shareholders are still getting paid. But in the end, it's hurting this country. Oh, but then why is it possible? Because they are the ones who fund the politicians that make free trade possible. It's called the circle of loot. The corporation funds the PACs and the super PACs. Super PACs donate to the politicians that's running on both sides of the aisle. They go, they run, one will win, and the corporations still win. Oh, and guess what? The money that the, corp the politicians pay to the corporate back media, it goes right back to the corporations because the corporations own the corporate back media. That's a circle of loot. They want it this way, but again, and I'll say this till I'm blue in the face, the only way to stop it is to stop voting for the people that allow this type of legislation to exist.
Well, let's get one thing straight. If, if I am uh, sent up to Washington, the hallmark of almost everything I do in terms of businesses and corporations will be that there is no business that is too big to fail. Absolutely no business too big to fail. Even Harley Davidson, I love Harley Davidson, I love motorcycles, it's a wonderful company. And I don't think that it would have seen the demise. We might have seen some restructuring, might have seen some reformatting of the business, but it would have survived. That's America. America's always risen up to meet its challenges. Corporate welfare is a form of bailing out of business. That's welfare that's no better or no worse than the welfare that is, is routinely uh, despised across the board. Uh, reducing the corporate income tax to zero is one of the best ways that we can make our American businesses much more competitive on a global scale. Believe me, you pay the corporate income tax. And if you don't understand that you pay the corporate income tax, let me help you understand the economies of that. Um, we can compete by making our businesses much more competitive by removing the obstacles, the, full, the regulations and obstacles and the burdensome financial obligations that they have to meet as being part of our federal government system right now. America can rise to that challenge again and can do that. Um, but rest assured that free trade is the best way to go without the restrictions that no pay favoritism and no privileges to any certain industry. Thank you. Some spirited, interesting comments, I thought. The next one is on foreign policy. Uh, President Washington said, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with uh, any portion of the foreign world. Thomas Jefferson said, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. President Eisenhower said, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Mr. Fontaine, your uh, thoughts on this? Goes back to President Monroe. Uh, foreign policy in the United States right now is totally ludicrous. That's about the only way I can describe it. We're throwing money at people. Uh, anybody here ever try to buy a friend? You know, it's stupid. You don't, you don't do that. You don't try to buy friends. But we're being considered or suckers by those that really don't like us. And I feel that money, as I said earlier, should be coming back here and not being thrown away overseas. Uh, our foreign policy has is, is gone downhill rapidly, and we are not being respected in the world. We have enemies, and the first thing your enemy has to do, believe me, is fear you. The next thing is, once he fears you, then he learns respect, and then from there we can start getting along with other nations. Okay? We don't draw a line in the sand and keep changing it. We don't let our people get killed and say, what difference does it make? Well, I'll tell that woman it makes a difference. If it was her daughter that was dead, would it make a difference? You know, when we talk about Watergate, Watergate was nothing. These are people that are dead. And I take exception to that. Thank you. When liberty, freedom was serious, and war was serious, that was World War II. We dropped that bomb, and nobody has messed with us since. Now, war is simply about money, because people benefit from it. And the money that they earn is off of the blood, sweat, and tears of our men and women that we send to fight these wars. Our Constitution is clear. Our military is for our borders. We have treaties to deal with our allies. We had no business going into Iraq. We had no business going into Afghanistan. We saw what happened with Russia, but we didn't care. There was money to be made. We had no business bombing Libya, and why would they even think that we had the right to go and bomb Syria? But the nature of all of this is money at the expense of our young men and women. And when you look at how they are treated when they come back home broken, it ought to make you mad as hell, because I'm mad. Mm -hmm. 
the, the single greatest threat to our national security is our, our debt. Uh, that's definitely the greatest threat of all. And look at some of our entangling alliances and the fact that in, in one particular instance, if, if uh, Taiwan is attacked by the Chinese, we're called to defend Taiwan, but we'd probably have to borrow the money from China to pay for that war. Uh, it's, it's ludicrous when you think about it. Uh, there are so many cost savings to be realized by eliminating the military industrial complex all over this world, not to mention bringing home the folks that are serving overseas that are away from their families. There's no need for us to be in so many places all over this country. Bring those folks home, shore up our resources here, strengthen some of the military bases that we have here in the country that we need to help uh, secure our defenses here in our own country. Um, Take care of our, um, our veterans, that's very true. Those people deserve so much uh, for what they've given to us, and that's very important uh, for sure. But uh, there's definitely no reason that a lot of these entangling alliances we get involved in, propping up dictators, you look through the history of time, it just seems like we forget history so often. If you go back and look at history, and so many times we've just we've been, we've failed to learn the same lessons. Um, and just even as brief history as, if, as I know about it, it's just, I'm like, can't you see that? Can't you see how that just did not work out for us? Just doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. Mr. Heron? There are countries in the world that need help. And we're a Christian nation, and, and we try to help those folks that need it. But just throwing money at a poor country don't solve the problem because it usually gets stolen. The leaders take it and put it in their pocket and deposit it in a Swiss bank account that they can retire on at some later point. Uh, I'm in favor of working a lot on this foreign aid thing. If there's a country where the people are starving, let's don't give them any money. Let's give them some food. If there's countries where people have Tremendous unemployment. Let's help them learn how to make something. Let's send some of our expert manufacturing people and teach them how to do things. Uh, let's loan them some money to buy some equipment to build a new plant to start making something that they can sell to the rest of the world. But let's stop giving money to them. I lived a year in Egypt. I don't know why we gave, what, $16 billion a year to Egypt? Uh, they looked like they were doing pretty good, but I, I understand that a good bit of that money went to build a new mosque over there. And I'm not in favor of those things. I say let's start working on reducing the money that we send overseas. Help the people that need help. Don't give them any dollars. Thank you. Uh, this is the uh, final question for the evening, and it's on uh, wireless wiretapping. HR 5949, FISA, extension of the wireless wiretapping. It was voted yes by both Senators Chambliss and Isaacson. Voted yes by Representative Gingrey and Kingston. Uh, Representative Brunt did not vote upon this. Uh, I would like the panel's uh, thoughts on how they would have voted about the wireless wiretapping in the FISA Act. Mr. Grayson. Part of one of the reasons why I'm running is that there is a systematic erosion of our liberties and our freedoms that many of us are missing. We are not smelling the coffee. We don't see the handwriting on the wall. My opponents voted for these erosions of our constitutional freedoms. And one question I always ask everybody, uh, and I've been doing it at the debates and where I go and speak, I ask, how much of the Constitution are you willing to do without? Or is only 100% of the Constitution acceptable? If 100% of the Constitution is acceptable, then there is no way that you can vote for these individuals that have voted to violate your constitutional protections. We wouldn't even know about it if it wasn't for Edward Snowden. It had to be leaked in order for us to find out. Now, if that is the kind of government that you want,
Keep voting for these guys that keep telling you, well, I'm fighting for you, and I'm going to go to Washington, and I'm going to do, I don't care what you're going to go do. I want representation. And if you won't give it to me, then I'll go and do it for myself and everybody else. And one last thing, I don't plan on going and doing it by myself. I will need your help. I plan to take you and the Constitution with me, and by taking you, I will expose the corruption, and it will be up to you to take out the trash. Thank you. How do you follow that? <laughs> No, in all seriousness, uh, Mr. Grayson's so right. I mean, you look back to the original origins of this bill was started in the 70s by Ted Kennedy. I mean, it just keeps getting reauthorized and reauthorized time and time again. I mean, enough's enough. I mean, when are we going to really wake up to this and realize that people are just telling us the same thing? And some of these people have been in Congress combined for 42, 60 years. I mean, it's just a fantasy land. I mean, we're sitting here believing the same thing. And... You know, we do get fresh candidates all the time that are running for office, and we don't gain traction. We don't get anywhere. We can't raise the funds. And the question's why? You know, the Tea Party's been at it since 2010. In four years, we've made a lot of progress, but we're still getting people with the NSAA and the NSA and things like this going on. And it's like, how can that happen? I mean, there are bigger forces at work in this country, and it's going to take so many people getting involved. And my aim in, in coming to forums like this and doing things like that, like that we are doing, is it's not necessarily to go to Washington. That's great. But the main point of it is to try to get each one of you to talk to one person that you didn't talk to that wasn't here tonight. Talk to one person and try to tell them something new you learned about the forum tonight, about a candidate, and try to just influence one person tonight um, tomorrow when you go back to work and go into your communities. Just one person, because that's what it takes. It's just one person changing at a time. And we can accomplish great things through that, such as the repeal of some of these wiretapping, wiretapping things, which are infringement of our liberties. Thank you. So, Mr. Herr? My opponent, Tom Braves, voted in favor of this also. I would have voted no. I don't know if you do a whole lot of emails, but I've noticed on my emails that I'll send out an email and they'll reply to it. And when it comes back, there are certain words that are underscored in this uh, email. And what that says to me is that this email has been filed somewhere under each one of those words as a subject. You take a look at some of them that you've got. They are being filed down there. Now let me tell you, if you were to send one out and you included kill and the president in the same email, you'd probably get somebody knocking on your door because they are checking every one of them. They're being uh, filed somewhere under those things so that somebody wants to know uh, president, the word president. And they hit a few keys and every email that says president a uh, name on it comes up so you can they can do it. They're all cataloged. I don't like that. I'd like to go back to where we had to get uh, an order from the judge for them to be able to look at whatever I say and whatever I do. Okay. I probably am the only one here that has had a top secret clearance, but I'm going to give you a secret about the NSA, okay? Don't tell anybody, but. <laughs> the biggest secret in the NSA is how much money they spend and how inefficient and bungling they are, you know? And these revelations that we have bring that up. The next problem we have is the stereotype thinking. You know, I'm the most conservative and I always vote no. Have you heard that? I don't know how everybody can be the most conservative and they always vote no, but they don't say what they would do in place of this, okay? Now, the Fourth Amendment is the Fourth Amendment. And if we have an emergency, and we have had during war time, from time to time, you know, a short period of time, maybe something like that. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. And the, and the problem is this bigger than just the NSA or whatever. 
It's regulatory law, okay? If you have a friend that's a lawyer, don't admit it, but ask him you know, about regulatory law. The Congress passes a law, and then they turn it over to the bureaucracy, and they crank out a thousand or more pages, and then it goes on and on from there. And there's never any review, never any uh, answering for what they passed. And uh, that, that's all part of the, of the problem. Thank you. You want my... We're through. We're through. Let's well, go. this is the... Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Not yet, sir. Uh, we would now, now like to, a chance at you. to <laughs> go on to the, uh, <laughs> the closing statements of our candidates. Uh, Ms. Walker, did you go first? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's true. <laughs> it's been a long night. <laughs> uh, thank you again for allowing us to come and speak. It's not often that the Libertarian candidate actually gets to speak this early in the process, so we're getting a head start of getting prepared and uh, being able to take questions like this. So, and these were some very tough questions, but you guys are very educated, and that's uh, that's the exception in the American electorate today, not the rule, unfortunately. So. Um, definitely encourage you guys, like I was saying, to go out and try to find at least one person that didn't know about the forum today and uh, educate them a little bit. And you guys are doing a great job of staying involved and staying active, and that's the most important thing. I always kind of judge everything I do by whether I'm doing better than the person that stayed home and sat on the couch that night. So we're, we're all doing a lot better than those people that are home tonight. So that's fantastic. But in all seriousness, uh, we do have some serious uh, responsibilities that are coming forward to us in this upcoming election. Um, and really have to look at the candidates that are before us. And I really challenge you to think not so much in terms of, well, the Senate hold, hangs in the balance and, you know, we've really got to think about what direction if we want to keep the party in charge and, you know, whether it's important enough to keep certain parties in power. You know, we've had the two-party system there for quite some time, and I know that it can be a little uh, risky in a sense of, thinking about having a third party and, and allowing those votes to go forward. But in Georgia, you do have to have a uh, majority of the vote. Um, so there will be a chance to vote who you're actually aligned with, more on a philosophical, philosophical standpoint. And then you can have your run off and vote for the true candidates you want. But it's time we get serious about electing a candidate that understands the power and responsibility of the individual and not the power and responsibility of the federal government. I am Amanda Swafford, and I'm running for you. Mr. Heron. My opponent, Tom Braves, voted 95% last year with uh, the Speaker of the House, John Boehner. Uh, he's, I saw one of the flaws that said, He's a rank-and-file Republican. He does what he's told. He's a career politician. He wants to stay up there the rest of his life. I have a few things that I want to try to accomplish. One of them is term limits. The other is to try to see if we can get a balanced budget amendment passed. I want to get uh, rid of the uh, earmarks, and I want our food labeled. I don't want to go to Walmart and pick up a can and it says imported by Walmart. When I pick up that can, I want it to say from China or from Vietnam or from Korea, wherever it's from. I want to know because I'm going to try to find the one that was canned in America. I want to buy the American products, particularly in food. All places where food is packaged are not clean. They're not sanitary. And I feel like most of our American food is, and that's what I want to buy. Yes, sir. I'll go home for you. I'm going to go early. I'm going to vote often, too. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, I, I'd like to tell you a little, little story because I taught political science for 15 years. I've asked my students, you know, what is the problem with America? You know, is it ignorance or is it apathy? And you know what they'd answer? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't care. <laughs> well, that's, there was a story to make a point, and by the time they left my class, they did know and they did care. And I, I would say to you folks here, and I'm really proud to see that you're here, and I'm really impressed with the number of people here. Uh, you need to go out and tell it on the mountain, you know? 
I live in Sochi, so everything's unknown to me. You need to go out and talk to those people that didn't vote, that allowed Obama to get a second term, you know? That's as simple as that. They need to get out there and vote this time and quit complaining. That's what my motto is, don't complain, vote. As for my opponent, it's ditto. It's more of the same. What Ken already said, so I won't repeat what he said. I can tell you that if you want to know what's going on, I would suggest that you go to government track slash U.S. Congress and Open Secrets. That's two places you can go. And, you know, you don't need to leave us. Just look and see. They, they have done nothing. Now, I'd like to close by saying something that Thomas Jefferson said. He said, when men fear government, you would have tyranny. When the government fears men, you'd have democracy. Now think about that, because look at the goons that we have coming after us in the IRS and everywhere else, out in Nevada and so forth. You know, we've got to put our foot down and get out there and vote. And if you don't like what you got, put something else in there. Vote the rascals out. That's what they used to say. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you this evening. Um, the definition of courage is going forward with something knowing that you might lose. When I started this race, I was told by the DeKalb GOP to pick something further down the trough. It's not my turn yet. And I said, you don't have to help me, just stay the hell out of my way. <laughs> I was told by friends in the Liberty Movement, you can't run a statewide race. Well, in five weeks I'll be in the seventh and final debate. I've ran a statewide race. Everybody on my staff, Jason Turner, Neil White, um, Ted Metz, Barbie Dunn, every single person on our staff are volunteers. And they have been working for months on end as volunteers because they believe in liberty and freedom. Not that they believe in me, I'm just simply a vessel carrying a message. And the message that I carry to you today is this. No matter what you think, the responsibility and the power is yours. There are people who died to give it to you. They gave you three embodying documents. You got the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights. Those three things, that is your inheritance. Don't give it away by continuing to buy the lies of those who would be your leader. In not one speech have I ever made have I said, I'm going to Washington to be the kind of leader that you need. I don't need a leader. You don't need one either. I think you're smart enough to lead your own lives. Your own lives. We have a constitution to guide us. And that is what they need to follow. I don't need four questions. All I need is one document. I'm not going to give you some. I'm going to give you all. And I'm not promising you anything extra. Just what you're entitled to. And that is your liberty and freedom according to the Constitution of the United States. Thank you all very much. I think it was a very thoughtful debate. I think we had a good uh, audience who was very uh, interested in this. And let's give them one more round of applause. stickers and stuff over there if y'all want them. <laughs> Yard signs. <laughs> Free. We, we truly appreciate you, all of you coming out tonight. I'm so glad that you're all here. And I have a request. Next month, before you get in the car to come over here to the tea party meeting, go next door, grab somebody and say, hey, look, it's going to be entertaining. We're going to have politicians there. You know. <laughs> Bring something to throw, whatever. But well, we need more people here. 
we do. We need you to bring your neighbors. And we need your neighbors to bring their neighbors because this is all in the, all in the of the uh, in the name of freedom, and it's all in the name of liberty, and understanding what we need to do in order to bring this country back where it needs to be. Thanks for coming. Yes, Penny. Oh, yes. Just one more thing. Uh -oh. We have some representatives here from other candidates. Yeah. We need to give them a few minutes to speak if they wish. They do you wish? <laughs> like Monty Hall says, come on down. Come on down. I didn't realize the boss was here. <laughs> no, the boss isn't here. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Steve Hamill. I'm the number one supporter of Karen Hill for U.S. Senate. You know, I'll keep it brief tonight. Karen is, uh, you know, is, is in the race. She's the only person in the race that's got a solid business experience and solid conservative experience, governing experience. Right, as Fulton County Chairman, she went in, took care of a $100 million spending problem, right, no tax increase, and left Fulton County in the best fiscal position it had ever been left in. As your first Republican Secretary of State, she went in, cut the agency by 20%, improved customer service, implemented photo ID, and works to ensure that only U.S. citizens can vote in Georgia. You know, Karen has a four-point plan that's out there. If you visit karensplan.com, all one word, that's karensplan.com, you'll see her four-point plan for turning around the economy. First, and I'll go through it real quick, I'll repeal and replace uh, Obamacare with Tom Price's HR 2300. Um, from a spending perspective, right, a balanced budget amendment, a two-year budgeting cycle, and the one-cent solution. From a tax perspective, we talked about taxes earlier, right? Repeal the 16th and, re put in, uh, and implement the fair tax. And then the regulatory environment just has to get under control. She thinks if you pass new regulations, you know, we should put a 10-year um, a uh, life cycle on that so that they have to be uh, looked at every other time. So um, next week, you don't have to wait till May 20th. You know, next Monday, uh, you can vote for Karen Handel for U.S. Senate, or you can wait till May 20th and join me in voting for, you, uh, for Karen Handel for U.S. Senate. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Going once. <laughs> Going twice. Penny, you got anything else? Y'all, thanks for coming. Have a great night. God bless you. We'll see you next time.